Hello everyone and welcome back to Shonen Archive. I'm Wookie and I'm here with Zenrot. Hello. What's Shonen Archive? I'm glad you asked. Shonen Archive is a series in which me and Zen have dedicated ourselves to watching every single Shonen Jump anime that is available to us in English throughout the history, past, present, and future, as long as me and Zen are still kicking it in some form or fashion. Is that accurate, Zen? That That is accurate, as long as we don't like explode into a fireball at some point. Yes. Then we're here. We're here for this. Yes, and even then, if I could figure out, if I'm currently planning to figure out how to turn into a ghost, if I can figure out how to be a ghost and still do the show, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> uh, then by that point, I'll have all the time in the world to watch all the anime. It's not like I could do much as a ghost, but I'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> this current series that we are going through is obviously Gintama is our big one, and then our other two that we are going through on other days are uh, Kuroko's Basketball and Jujutsu Kaisen, which Jujutsu Kaisen we will start actually in two days from now. So, yay! But today we are talking about Gintama. Zen. And also we made it to 100 episodes of Gintama. I think that deserves like a round of applause for us. Good job. Pat on back. Thank you. My brother is clapping in the background. <laughs> we never thought... <laughs> we made it. We made it, everyone. I don't know how... We made it, but we did. How do you feel, Zen? A hundred episodes of a series that neither one of us ever thought we would see more than two. Yeah, we're we're in there. We're going hard. Yeah, feels good. So let's talk about the episode today, which is episode ninety. This is the perfect one because I I was really confused for the vast majority of it until the punchline hit at the end of it. it was episode <laughs> ninety six of Gintama. If you're a man, don't give up. Go ahead, Zen. Tell us all about it. So, uh, we uh, get introduced to this planet where it's being destroyed by, like, these uh, supposed alien invaders that are, uh, like, attacking and they're wiping out all life. And so humans have started to hide underground and they called for Umibozu, the, the only hope for the planet's survival because he's this legendary warrior. Um they get attacked. That the, our two characters that are new to this get attacked by the aliens, but then Umibozu arrives at the last minute to save them. Um, they realize he has like a horrible toupee, and they're trying not to make fun of him because he's very sensitive. And every time <laughs> someone says anything that's remotely close to the word bald, he gets really upset. Uh, like one of them says, "What is he like? You're a bold, a bold fighter." And he's like, "What the fuck did you just call me?" <laughs> um, call me bald and then at that point they start flipping the word back and forth <laughs> mm -hmm. and then uh they they get back to the base after a comedic drive in a convertible where his toupee is like hanging off the side of his head um and they're giving this speech about how umibozu is gonna save them and then the guy uh of our two new characters smacks his toupee off and everyone's like haha you're you're bald idiot and they leave <laughs> and Umibozu figures out that he did it on purpose to make people leave because he wants to give up on the planet. Because it turns out the alien invaders are, in fact, um, the core of the planet uh, to, like, to protect it from threats and stuff. It's, but, it's how they um, cultivated the planet for actual, like, migration of people being there. But then they abused it, and that's why it, the Atlas, that's yeah, what it's the, called. They, uh, they became, like, a threat to the planet. So the, the machine counteracted them and the the girl doesn't want to leave because like a an escape group comes to like take them away uh the girl doesn't want to leave because she thinks that as long as they try they can save the planet um the spheres end up attacking the base and the girl goes out to fight them alone because everyone else has given up uh, and she's trying to protect a sapling that she planted to prove that you can grow plants in this barren soil um, she is injured, and Umibozu and the guy come and save her. Um, she says she's not leaving no matter what, and so Umibozu knocks her out so that she goes, she can be taken onto like the rescue ships, and he stays behind, um, and fights the spheres alone after everyone else leaves. And then it's revealed that three months later, he managed to clear out the whole planet of the the spheres on their own, or on his own. Um, 
and he gets a very cool scene where he jumps up and starts fighting them with, with the theme song playing, like yeah. the, the opening song. <laughs> he does. Um, and then they're like, no, we can, you know, the world's not dead. We can rebuild it. And it goes to look at where the, the little baby sapling tree was, and it's like a weird curly cue of, of hair. And then it's revealed that uh, they're standing on Umibozu's bald head, which now has one curly cue hair on it. And that this entire story was just an advertisement for, uh, like, bald cream. Yeah. And it ends with uh, them watching the... Which is my favorite line where they go, that was a 30-minute long commercial. Yeah, and they just scream at the end about it. And then I think Kenta, or Kenta, Kentucky says, give us back our, our damn screen time. <laughs> and that's how it ends. Uh... Let's go into it. So, <laughs> my specific thoughts on this one. I was vastly confused. Well, I like the beginning of it because it basically starts like Star Wars and they use that uh, fake Star Wars theme that they have. Yeah, the not real Star Wars song. Yeah, the do 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 Like the legally distinct version of Star Wars, which is really good. Um, they play a lot of this fairly straight. Up like the specific problem with the planet, you would never have guessed that this is where it was going until the very end. But at the same time, I kind of did like that they were really heavily emphasizing the bald stuff because I was like, okay, yeah, it's just more bald jokes. But it completely changes everything when you realize that this is supposed to be a commercial for to make bald people look good and say there is hope for you. You can grow hair <laughs> finally. Yeah, again. the whole thing was like, uh, you know, you should never give up, and then. The, the, it ended up being you should never give up and accept that you're bald because real, <laughs> what is it, like, be a man and don't give up? Yeah, be a man and don't give up, uh, which is really good. That made me end up, like, I actively going, like, th this fucking show when they revealed that it was a commercial this entire time. <laughs> the world's longest commercial. Um, I like that. I liked it when... It's funny because Omibozo is a very much a, like a silly character, but also whenever he's a silly up until he starts fighting, and then he becomes an unbelievable badass. Yeah, it's always funny because he's just like a like a. I don't even. Ha I, I mean, I guess that's kind of every character on the show, but Omibozo is like over the top goofy. Like uh, when he's he's fighting the aliens at the end, and it's playing the like the Gintama theme song, and it's actually like really cool. It is. And he's, like, talking to Kakura in his head. And he's like, uh, I can't believe I'm gonna... I'm gonna save this planet all for a woman. Kakura, don't tell your mom. I'm one bad daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the bad daddy. <laughs> yes, he was amazing. And I think that there's a dis distinction of when Umibozo has on the helmet, and he's like the coolest character in the world. And then the second the the helmet comes off, the 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 shade goes away until he starts fighting again. <laughs> but even when he's not fighting, some of the words that he said were very. Um, he got a lot of badass lines in there too when he's talking about the world, the planet, and all this. But yeah, all the stuff around the planet is just played so serious that you. I just actually was like, I guess I just believe it in this and that he's really doing this. So that end reveal was just amazing. It it was really well done and it made me end up liking the entire episode. It completely makes me think it again differently going like, that's right, this is a commercial. So that explains why those people were just so unbelievably cruel the second it revealed that he was bald. <laughs> Yeah, they all were immediately like, what a fucking loser. <laughs> yeah, like the 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 switch up from them going like, oh my god, he's bald, bald loser, whatever, get out of here. For them, to them going like, oh yes, you are bald, of course they wouldn't take you seriously. <laughs> and the idea that the message here is that actually a bald man can be that and more <laughs> and also still grow back hair <laughs> is pretty great. I think also the spears were because I know this only because Crunchyroll told me were a specific reference to Captain Harlock, which is another Harlock reference. Uh, because obviously in the opening that we had for we've had for a while now, there's Space Captain uh, Katsura, which is one of his disguises yes, there. Captain so, Katsura, yeah, Captain Katsura. So it was nice to see more of it. I'm learning a lot about <laughs> Space Captain by watching this show. 
Uh, I actually thought it was a uh, probably some kind of Akira reference because that's what I think of when it went into like letterbox mode and I saw a giant black spear. That's where my brain went to, but it wasn't so. But yeah, I liked it. I thought it was a good one to start off for this one. It was a good just way of going like, ah, oh, that's right. This is the show that I'm watching. <laughs> this mm-hmm. this is the show willing to de- de- devote an entire episode to what is basically one single punchline joke. <laughs> How'd you feel about it? It was good. It was funny. I, I, I like actually got into the plot of like this one woman refusing to give up, and everyone else was like, "I've already surrendered." Um, I, th- I thought the scene of him fighting all the aliens was cool. I was like, "Wow, this is a actually legitimately really cool episode for this character." Uh, and then it ended up being a hair ad, which was <laughs> really funny. <laughs> so I can't really complain. Yep, best of both worlds in that instance. It is really funny that we're just so programmed for Gintama to be, like, the humor of it, specifically in this instance, where it's, like, it can go from so silly, like, the idea that we wouldn't even realize that it was a commercial of some kind, until the end reveal of it all. (laughs) It's like, no, this is just how this world works, you know, some guy, he's goofy, he's guffawing, but then there's a serious thing going on, and when it's serious, everyone takes it extremely serious. And so that I believed everything that was I did not I I did not see the commercial twist coming until it was too late <laughs> until the end and I was like ah it fucking got me. So well done. Yeah, well, it, it had the same like vibe as a serious Kintama episode, like one of the ones where they're they're gonna do some serious stuff. And I was like, okay, that's a pretty neat little side thing. And then the the gag at the end was really good. Yes, I agree. So that's episode 96. Let's move on to episode 97, which is exaggerate the tales of your exploits by a third so everyone has a good time. And this is a two-parter in the second part. I think part... What the fuck was part B called? Part B is called Men Have a Weakness for Girls Who Sell Flowers and Work in Pastry Shops. <laughs> but we'll start with part A for now. Zen, tell us what this one's about. So part A is about Catherine, uh, and it even has, like, a different o- uh, OP, where it's, yeah. like, her... It's, like, I'm assuming Lu- it's a loop in the third reference. Yeah, it is. With, uh... Okay, I don't know anything about loop in the third, but I, I, that's what I assume. So, my favorite bit about this is that the girl that Catherine is playing, Fujiko, has extremely large breasts, and they made her boobs bigger for this opening! <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that is Fujiko! <laughs> that is like, that's not how she usually looks! But that That's was the joke, funny. is that because Fujiko is so crazy stacked, they decided to do it for... They went all out for this OP. I really enjoyed it as someone who has watched Lupin in the past. So it was very well done. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so they they have, like, a Lupin the Third opening, uh, and then they have a little moment with, like, Atose and them where uh, they're all cleaning up her place because they owe her rent, as always. Mm-hmm. Um... And Catherine tells them, like, if they're not going to pay rent, they can just get out, blah, blah, blah. And her and Kagura start fighting. Um, and then Shimpachi tries to break them up and it ends up fighting Kagura. Because I think he, they're like, she tells Catherine she's going to rip her cat ears off and make her into a trailer park housewife. Um, Important because it comes back later. Yeah, Catherine says, like, she's going to take away Kagura's ahas or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and make her into a normal character. Yes. Uh, and then Shimpachi goes like, "Ladies, ladies, let's let's not fight. Come on." And Kagura says, "Should I take those glasses off your face and make you an even wimpier character?" And he gets pissed, <laughs> and he runs in like, "How fucking dare you say that shit to me?" It was um, just funny because so he she she he comes in with so much bluff. Yeah, okay, no, you're good into it. Go ahead. Yeah, she she starts fighting him instead of Catherine, and then someone from Catherine's past comes up and starts talking to her, and um. In the background, while he's talking to her, you just see Kagura beating the shit out of Shimpachi <laughs> on the ground through the entire scene. Just like, um, bah, bah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, ah, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, this is just getting crushed by Kagura the whole time, uh, and then it turns out it's a thief from her old thieving days who wants her to come back. Um, she refuses because she's trying to reform herself. Um, they threaten Atose if she doesn't do it, and then so she goes to meet up with them, but then she kind of was like, I, I'm not going to do it, I'm sorry. 
leave Atose alone, and you know you can you can just like beat me up or whatever if you want to. Um, so the guy starts hitting her, and then he says he's gonna cut her ears off and turn her into a trailer park housewife. Yep. Um, and then Gintoki ends up rescuing her, uh, and consoles her, and is like, "Oh, you know." The old lady kicked me out, and I'm sleeping on the street. Do you think you could put in a good word for me so she'll let me sleep at the place? And then it zooms out, and Kagura, Shimpachi, and Atose are there. Um, and so it's revealed that, like, Atose asks them to help Catherine. And in return, they get a month of free rent. Hmm. I, hmm. I actually took it as, like, Gintoki was always going to was going to go help her, and then the other three just so happened to be there for when he did it. Like, I don't think she specifically asked him to do it, because I don't think Kentucky needed to be told. That's why I took it anyway, in this specific instance. But, you know, it also makes sense for her to be able to hire them. Because Shimpachi says, like, surely that's worth three months. And then she goes, like, you gotta be kidding. That That's one month, and that's good enough. So, hmm. That's interesting. I didn't even think about the idea that she was hired. But maybe it's also because in my mind, like, Kentucky would obviously go and help someone if they were in that dire of a straight, even if he does always fight with Catherine. I don't think there's been a, a single scene in which Kentucky has said a single nice thing about Catherine. <laughs> no, almost never. <laughs> almost never. Yeah, even when they're like, uh, they tell Atosa, and like, we gotta help her. I mean, Kentucky just walks in and he's like, yeah, nah, leave her alone. <laughs> what do you say? He says, people people with no backbone will bend over no matter what, and people with a backbone will always stand tall, so it doesn't matter. Leave her alone. Yeah, and that's why he decides to help right when she starts getting beat up, because at that point he's like, well, she obviously does have a backbone, and they're taking advantage of this, so now I'm going to interfere. He also has a really good line, too, when he interferes, where he's like, I... It's like, I don't have a sharp sword, but I have a wooden uh, but I have a wooden one, he just smacks him with it. Yeah, because the guy's like, give me your sword, and then Gintoki's pretending to be the guy, and he's like, oh, I don't have one. And the guy's like, what? Yes, you do. And he goes, no, I'm afraid I don't have a sword, but I do have a wooden sword you can have whenever you want. And he cracks him with it. <laughs> Which is very good. So, yeah, that's part A. Um, obviously, I really love that beginning. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of loop in the third, but I've seen enough of it on Adult Swim randomly to recognize the opening for it and recognize those characters and know what they are. So it was really nice to see it. I really did like that gag of Catherine being made to look much much sexier than she actually was, than she actually is, but she keeps the face, which is the funny part to me. Yeah, she's still got the same, like, Catherine face. <laughs> yeah, which is really good. Um, I like seeing the in-between. So we never saw how Catherine got back with In the Good Graces of Atose. We didn't see that, so this was kind of our way of seeing it now. Um, and I thought it was actually a very nice uh, uh, scene where she's actually trying oh, to... Where she's going to steal the, from the guy on the bench? Yeah, but not only that, she was. they showed the actual rehabilitation part where she doesn't actually get accepted because she's an, a Monto and people don't already like her because of that. But then also, whenever she tries to get a job, she also can't really get it because she's also a convicted felon. So there's really no way for her to do anything. Um, so she feels more like she wants to stop being a thief, but at the same time, because of the specific landscape of the world, there's no one actually out there to help her in any way, shape, or form. Um, so she wants to, so she's ready to go back to what she is, because that's obvious, like, at this point, the society has decided that no matter how much you try and change, it doesn't really matter, because you did that once, that's always going to be what you are until the end of time. But then she gets stopped by Atose, and Atose says, like... Because she starts crying, because she starts crying about how hard it is, and she's like, well, first of all, you should try changing, and then you can cry all you want. It doesn't make any sense to cry when you haven't tried. So I thought that was nice. Um, it was also nice to see how she got back to him, because again, we never saw that up until this point, so that was cool. Uh, all the bits there where they're talking about them being uh, thrown out of the house were really funny, when she says, like, would you like to live in this box? <laughs> when she offers yeah. the box to them to live in? <laughs> And uh, Cogger immediately destroys the box and says, like, this box is too small. <laughs> I also really like, um, during that rehabilitation bit, mm -hmm. uh, when she finally gives up and goes to, like, be a thief again, um, she goes to steal a wallet out of this guy's, like, kimono, and Atose stops her uh, by grabbing her wrist. And she's like, is this really, you know, what you're going to be? Are you just going to go back and, and be a thief again? Um, and, you know, then she, you know, gives the whole thing where She's like, I can't, um, I can't do anything else. Like, there's nothing else 
there for me. And Atose throws her uh, and throws the whole bench. And the sleeping guy is still on the bench. <laughs> and uh, when she's like laying on the ground after Atose throws her in the background of the shot, the, the guy that was sleeping on the bench is still laid out on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice that. Yeah, Every he's gun... laying on the ground during that whole thing. That's pretty good. That's pretty funny. Um, I also like it when Kentucky leaves for a bit, and then when he comes back, he reveals that he left to go get his most valuable figure, and that's what he was going to use to pay for the rent. Yes, he was going to pay for the rent with his most valuable possession, which was a fucking uh, figurine of that reporter that he likes. Yes, it's like super special limited edition <laughs> version. I'm ready to give it up. This is my most prized possession. I think she says, please leave. <laughs> tells him to get no, out she of doesn't him. even say that she punches him through the door perfect that's actually the way to do it um yeah i thought it was a very good part a of it here catherine is definitely one of those characters that is just kind of usually in the background and she does fine but it was nice to kind of just have her have her moment she didn't have a full episode but this is perfectly good and i was always wondering how catherine got back in there because it was always weird to me that when she comes back She's just back and nobody, other than making fun of, like, she's a thief. Why would you bring her back? And it's like, nah, it's fine. She's, she's back now. Uh, so it was kind of nice to see her come back. And obviously, any time where Kentucky gets to show up and be a hero is very nice. And I like the scene that he had where he beats the shit out of that guy <laughs> by showing up out of nowhere. Um, yeah, good stuff. How do you feel? Uh, it was good. Yeah, it was cute. It was not not a ton to it. I mean, it was, it's a two-parter, mm -hmm. so there's, like, automatically not a lot to it just by default because that's just how these two-parters are. They're very much just, like, little bite-sized things. Um, but it was cute. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Now let's go on to the part B of it here, which part B is men have a weakness for girls who sell flowers and work in a pastry shop. Uh, shops. Which is, a uh, I don't know, accurate. I actually was thinking about this for a while. I was like, do men have a weakness for girls who sell flowers and work in pastry shops? And then I remembered, I think Final Fantasy VII is an entire series based off someone having a weakness for a girl who sells flowers. So she's halfway That's there. True. So I would say that this is an accurate statement. <laughs> Go ahead, Zen. Tell us what it's about. Uh, so... This one, uh, Gintoki gets sick, and so he's not able to work, and so Kagura and uh, Shinpachi end up taking over for the day um, to like do his, his job. Um, the person that was going to hire them that day arrives, and so Kagura's like, I'm going to do it. And so she's at the desk wearing Gintoki's clothes, uh, uh, and she's like, giving kind of like Gintoki-esque like poignant observations of like you know to you he, the because she thinks that her husband is cheating on her so she's like I want you to investigate my husband and prove that he's cheating on me so that I can get a divorce because I can't get one if he he won't accept it um and she's like you know he might be a, a deadbeat husband to you but to these children he's their father and I can't have you in here, you know, ruining their image of their father. And Shinpachi's like, oh my god, she's turning into Kentucky. <laughs> and so they decide instead of finding proof that he's cheating on her, they're gonna find proof of his unconditional love for her. Uh, and they leave. And then Shinpachi, like, gets on board with it, and he keeps calling her Gurasan. <laughs> and the way he says it every time fucking kills me. Because he, like, growls it out. It's so funny. It, it's similar to how he says G Gintoki, isn't it? It's just, a, except for he's saying Gorazan now? Yeah. It, yes. <laughs> it, how into really, it he is. Good. It's really funny because he gets really into her performance when she's in the office. Because he says, we're only three minutes into part B and she's already in the lecture mode. <laughs> Which is what Gintoki does at the end of all episodes. Yeah, wait until the end of the episodes. Um... So they decide to go off, and they're riding Gintoki's bike, and she's, like, in all of his way too big for her clothing <laughs> while they're riding on the bike. Um, they arrive at the cafe where the husband works, which turns out to be the same uh, Kunoichi cafe that uh, Sachan, Sachan works at. Yeah. Uh, they crash because Kagura doesn't know how to park the bike, uh, and they crash through the wall of the place, and they're like, well, shit, we can't... Uh, 
we can't like silently investigate this guy because he's looking right at us because we crashed into his <laughs> store. Um, Sachan comes out, and she's like, "Oh my God, Kintoki, is that you?" And Kagura's like, "Uh, oh yeah, I'm Kintoki. Come here, you pig. Give me those boobies." <laughs> and she's like, "Yep, that's him." Which is so funny because Gitoki does not act that way to her at all. No, no, she immediately starts feeling her up and says, "Hey, you pig! Nice rack. Give me, <laughs> let me look at." Him. Which, yeah, Gintoki is always like, "I need you to get away from me," <laughs> but, and so she's like completely on board. She's like, "Oh yeah, that's Gintoki, all right." Yes. And then she asks why Gintoki shrank, <laughs> and Kagura's like, "Oh yeah, there was an accident, and I shrank. Give me your boobs again." <laughs> I want to. I was, uh, she says something about drinking from him, and she's like, "I will gladly f- breastfeed you as much as you want." And then uh, I um, think that's when the shop owner says, "Like, please don't do this in public." <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but whatever you're doing, stop. Um, and yeah, so then uh, they go back to the base. Um, and they bring back the husband because Kagura accidentally knocks him out. Um, and Kagura's like, I figured it out. He's having an affair with Sachan, which is not true. Uh, and so Kagura kind of convinces um, Sachan to play along with the affair to prove her correct because that would make Gintoki jealous. Uh, it doesn't work, but she does play along with it and it makes the wife mad and she like beats her husband up. Uh, so they go to find another lead, and it's Sachan, Kagura, and Shinpachi all together this time. And they end up at a flower shop, um, where they find out that he was making, like, a picture of her out of flower petals. He was, like, trying to make art of her. And that was why he smelled, like, flower petals and perfume and stuff all the time, and why he was out so late, is he was trying to do it in secret. Um, and they destroyed it when they crashed the bike again, because, again, Kagura can't park the bike. So she crashes it directly into this building and it destroys the thing that he's working on. Um, so they they bring back like the ruined remnants of it because they tried to fix it themselves and they ended up spelling her name wrong. Um, and they spell her name wrong all the way down the street because they left a trail of flower petals in her name all the way down the road and all of them are spelled wrong except for one. There's one that's correct. And she stops at the one that's correct, and they, like, reconcile after that. Yeah. And, I think and it... then they all end up with the flu. They're all laying in bed sick. And uh, they're like, I hope that worked. I couldn't remember what her name was. And Gintoki's like, you guys are idiots. It's the wrong one. <laughs> he says the wrong name. He's like, it's that one. Dumbasses. <laughs> and that's how it ends. Uh, part B. Let's talk about it. This one I really like. <laughs> It might have been just because of how dedicated to the role Kagura is into being and into what is the new version of Gintoki, which is Gura. Um, <clears throat> it was really funny. <laughs> like, the way that the bike is progressively getting worse in every scene that you see it in. <clears throat> like, it keeps all the battle damage of every single time it crashes, which yeah, I thought all was... all the times that she crashes it. <laughs> Which is really funny. Um, all the stuff with Sanchan was really funny. Um, when she was like so... Because she acts like just nothing like... Into, she's act, She was doing a fairly good job of being him up until this scene where she actually starts to show interest and goes like, Hey, you pig woman, come over here. Bring them <laughs> boobies to me right now. And the way she's just like totally into it, she's like, yes, of course. This is... <laughs> why would I expect anything different from Gintoki? <laughs> this is how he is. Yeah, and she's, like, into it, which it's not at all what Kentucky is like. Nothing. And then I also really liked another scene that she does later on, which is because uh, another thing that they show a lot of is that they keep going back to Kentucky uh, trying to rest, because this was the whole reason that they're doing it instead of him is because he's sick. Um, but when they show him resting, all the kids are, like, making a ruckus around him. And there's a really funny scene where, while things are going bad around him and they're, like, fighting, Sachan is just, like, in the back- in the background, slowly, he's just sl- sliding up next to him to sleep next to him. Yeah, there's, like, when he goes to spy on them, too, and they're, like, crawling up to the door, um, Sachan is clung around his waist and he's, like, dragging her behind him <laughs> while he tries to go up to the door. Yeah, which was really good. 
Uh, I like that. I like the little stuff with... Uh, I like the beginning part where she immediately starts giving, like, the, the moral lesson of the story before the lesson has even begun. <laughs> Just being on the husband's side and thinking, like, oh, you're all good here, let me tell you. He's a good man. He, he, he may be a... You may seem like a deadbeat. That this is the only father that these kids know. <laughs> Uh, that was really well done, and in general, I thought it was a very good part B. It it was exactly as long as it needed to be. I think <laughs> I yes. don't know if it could go any longer, but for how much it was there, it was perfect and it worked out. And it was kind of nice to see the other ninja guys too, because then the um, what's his name is there as well, the Shonen Jump Ninja, and then the girl who also worked with him, uh, Waki Kari, the the Rose Ninja. From from there as well. Uh, what is his name? Zenzo. Zenzo was w- there, Waki- but but then the Zenzo the... and Wa- it's like Wakikaru or something. Wakikaru. Wakikara. Yeah, yeah Wakikara, yeah. something like that. But she was there. It was nice, kind of seeing them. I've forgotten that they just work at a florist shop. <laughs> but either way, it was nice to see them. And yeah, perfectly good. How did you like it? It was really good. Yeah, I like this one more than the last one. Uh, Kagura was just very funny in this one. Just quality in general. Yeah. And it is really funny that she didn't get new clothes of her of his. It's just the same old clothes. <laughs> just like you see her dragging it around in scenes that's clearly too small for her. Yeah, it's just like dragging along the ground. Hmm. Very well done. So let's move on to the next episode, which is a two-parter. The start of the next arc, episode ninety-eight. Oh man, this one was a, a, a time back. It really brought me back to the 2008 when I remembered doing something similar to this when the Wii came out originally. <laughs> Episode 98, play video games for only an hour a day. Go ahead, Zen. Uh, so the new newest gaming console, the Bentendo Owie, is coming out. <laughs> um... And everyone's in line to get it because they they want to get the new thing. Um, there's a reporter talking about like, oh, it's so crazy, you know. Everyone's everyone's trying to get this console, and a bunch of smoke blows across the screen, and it's because Gintoki and Kagura and Shimpachi are there, and they've made a fire mm-hmm. um, to like keep warm because of how cold it is. Uh, and they start eating food from Heidi to like. Uh, entice people, I guess, to, like, uh, trade places with them in line. Um, which works for a little bit, but they don't get high enough in the line, and they're, they reveal they've been hired to uh, buy five consoles for their clients, but they don't think they're going to get any because of how long the line is. Uh, Katsura ends up being there, and he wants a Famicom, which is, like, a old. And Kentucky's like, you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Like, why are you here? <laughs> he wants a twin Famicom, which features the disc system. Yeah, he's like, I can't believe I'm going to get a twin Famicom. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They don't even make those anymore. Um, and they're like, why aren't you in disguise? He's like, oh, the Shinsengumi aren't going to be here. And then as soon as he says that, the Shinsengumi are there. Also <laughs> waiting in line for the new, uh, the, the Owie. Um... And they're, like, having a bath, and the guy ends up uh, kicking his, their bath over and everything, and then uh, Hijikata starts walking over, so they hide Katsura under their table, like one of those heated Japanese eating tables, whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, the Katsudan? No, wait, no. I'm, I think I a Katsudan is a beef bowl of some kind. Uh, they're they're under, underneath some kind of... Yeah, I know what you're table. talking about. I'm now yeah. very annoyed that I'm not remembering... Because it's a very uh, important plot point in Persona 4. <laughs> th- that they're looking for this. Nanako wants one. and then... But continue on. It's a kata- Kutatsu! Kutatsu! Damn it! Kutatsu, yeah. <laughs> I-, I remembered it two seconds too late. <laughs> um, we need to buy a Kotatsu at Juness. Let's go, big bro. And that was the last time anyone had ever heard from Nanako <laughs> for Sonic <Sword of> Four. <laughs> now in the now in stores, <laughs> buy it to see the rest of the story. <laughs> Sorry, continue <laughs> on, continue on. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so they like are hanging out in line together, <clears throat> and uh, the doors open, and Gintoki and Hijikata just sprint to the front and jump in because they're just gonna get the first one. Uh, and a riot breaks out, and they're like fighting each other to try to get it. Um, 
and they said like, "Oh, we have the Nintendo PR representative," and he's like, "Oh, it's okay. They they just couldn't wait anymore because the <laughs> release date got pushed back for so long." Uh, but we have a solution, and so the manager walks out and he's like dressed in this like magician's outfit, and he's like, "A true gamer would game for his console." And everyone's like, fuck you, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Shut um, up, idiot. <laughs> you stupid. Yeah, they're all, like, yelling at him, and he gets mad. And then the PR rep is like, oh, no, the manager has reverted to his unpleasant <laughs> self. <laughs> um, and then the the uh, Odd Jobs crew, like, sticks their lower d- chin out, which apparently is, like, something that a famous Japanese gamer does. And they're like, hey, you should bet on us. And then when we win, you'll get a console. And then the Shinsengumi does the same thing. And they're like, okay, this is actually kind of interesting. I will bet. Um, And they also make a distinction that Hichikata is still doing the lower lip thing, but he's doing it for the wrong person. He's He's doing it for, like, a wrestler because he doesn't know who the gamer guy is. (laughs) Uh I got that reference. I was like, I know that guy. (laughs) They they reference uh-huh. this a couple times in, in Gintama already, but every single time I think it's funny. <laughs> Giant shit, Inoki. Continue. So uh, they're they're determining what games are going to be played and who's going to play them. And the first game is a dating sim game, and the, the our main crew was like, I don't, I never played any of these. I don't really know how. And Kondo is like, I have played every single one ever made <laughs> many times over. I know exactly what to do. Um. And then all of a sudden, the the heated table that's just sitting on the floor starts laughing. And uh, Katsura starts yelling at him from under the table. And he's like, you don't, uh, you you think you have love down to a science, but you always must expect the unexpected in love. <laughs> and he busts out from under the table wearing a Mario hat and mustache. Um, and I'm everyone is him. full, except for, obviously, the gang. Uh, all of the Shitsengumi buy it. <laughs> um, so that Hichikata's even like, hey, I'm a big, I'm a big Nintendo fan. Can I get like a picture? And Castro's like, no. Uh, if I do that, people are gonna swarm. And he's like, oh, what about an autograph? He's like, oh, no. And he's like, well, what about just a a genuine handshake? <laughs> and they like shake hands. <laughs> I loved it. This was the, the Hichikata moment where you learned that he's actually a huge <laughs> Nintendo fan. And yeah, loves he's a big Mario. fan of Nintendo. And then it's revealed that uh, Okita is a Sega fan, and Kondo is a PlayStation fan. A Zony. Uh, yeah, Zony, the Sony knockoff. What's the Sega one? Uh, they call it the... Shoot. They call it the something cast. The, the Cream Puff cast? Something it's, it's like the that. the Cream cast, but I don't the remember cream. what the Sega fake name. It was the something Cream cast. Oh, man. they call. I think they call Sega... Oh, man, it's going to be really annoying. It's very close to Sega, though. Zega. They yeah, call him Zega. The, the Zega cream cast. Zega cream uh, cast. And, and, uh, keep waiting for your sequel to Shenmue, yeah, stupid. Keep waiting for your Shenmue sequel. <laughs> and what does he say? Like, I'll, I'll wait forever. I I'll, know it's going to happen. I'll keep on waiting no matter what anyone says. I'm sure it'll come back. Um, By the way, this was in 2008 and in 2017. There's another joke that I want to talk about when we get to this episode of how unbelievably close it is to something that actually happens. But it's not till episode 100, I think. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. So, and then 90, uh, 98 ends with uh, Okita saying, that's not a Mario. Uh, that's fake. This one's Mario. And it's Elizabeth wearing a <laughs> Luigi hat and mustache. <laughs> And then all that does is make Hijikata bad, and he's like, you don't know shit, that's Luigi. (laughs) (laughs) Also, there's a really good joke I forgot about from earlier, where Katsura is like, you mean there's no more Famicom? You mean I'll never meet Mario again? And (laughs) Kintoki's like, what the fuck are you talking about? There's like 50 Mario games. Yeah, he's been revived dozens of times. Yeah, he's like, you mean I'll never meet Mario again? And And then when they're like... He's like, it's been around all the time. He's like, oh, great. How is his brother with the self-esteem issues doing? And they're like, how dare you? My Don't f- act like you know no Luigi. <laughs> this is my favorite line. It is from Katsura. It is, I see, is his younger brother with the inferiority complex still thriving? <laughs> it's- yeah, is he still thriving? <laughs> what a terrible thing to say. What do you know about Luigi? 
Yeah, and they all like, get mad at him for saying it. <laughs> I love, yes, I love this moment too where Katsura is like, I, will I ever be reunited with Mario? <laughs> and Kitoki just angry, going, idiot! And, yeah, and so also, another really good joke is Katsura busts out from <laughs> under the table and he's in the Mario disguise. Um, and someone calls him Mario and he immediately goes, I'm not Mario, I'm Katsura. <laughs> <laughs> and Shinpachi has to stop him from outing his identity. And then yes. they're up, ready to play the game. And he's like, Gintoki, they have this really serious moment where Gintoki's like, hey, be careful, you know, because if they find out who you are, like, we, we can't save you, it's over. Uh, and then Katsura goes, I'm not Zura, I'm Katsuo. <laughs> and it ends. <laughs> it's pretty good. This, oh man, I love, this two-parter here, I, I fucking love so much. It's so good. I, it, it was so funny because I can't believe there was a fucking, it's a two-parter. Yeah, the part where it's like a two-parter and this continue on. Oh, I was so happy. I think someone in the comments uh, last week said, like, I can't wait for you to see the upcoming video game references. Because they started doing a little bit more modern ones. I was like, oh, I can't wait for that. And then th this was literally the one to come up. And I was like, oh, I'm fucking loving every single bit of this. <laughs> this one and 99. I was just, like, thriving, living every moment. <laughs> So first of all, back in the day, I also went out to go try and find a Wii on release in North America with my mom back in the day. Uh, wasn't able to find it at all. <laughs> this thing was fucking impossible to find. We didn't actually stage out and like wait all night, thank God. But we did go to pl Toys R Us's and stuff where it was reported to have it and we waited in line. And then as we were leaving because we were denied and not enough people were there. we I was there for the moment when they told a whole line of people saying, we're out of Wii's after like getting like 10 people a Wii. And everyone going like, God damn it. And then other people were going to other stores to try their luck there. And then my mom was like, let's just go home. And then there was a fucking scalper who tried to scalp the weed that they had just bought. He's like, sell it to you for four fifty. I remember my mom going, fuck you. And then just walked away. <laughs> <laughs> but she said it in Spanish. I can't repeat the Spanish words because I'm afraid of what she specifically said. But she was not happy with that guy. She let him know. So I have a lot of genuine, like, nostalgia for this time where the Wii was coming out and it was, like, the hottest thing in the world. It is, it's actually kind of impossible, I guess, for kids that come up after this, right? It's kind of hard to specifically put into words how stupid hype. Yeah, the Wii era was, was odd. Yes, but also, like, the lead-up to it beginning because they were coming off of GameCube, like, no one was thinking of Nintendo. <laughs> Not really. A lot of people like uh, GameCube now, but GameCube was, like, third, where Xbox was had one game. <laughs> Think about that for a while. That uh, Xbox had, like, Halo, and that was enough to be second <laughs> behind. Yeah, pretty much. Halo, like, was fucking revolutionary at the time. Yeah, it was, it was. And that was enough to completely catapult a regular Xbox, and then the 360 came out, and then it was back when Microsoft was actually at number one, and then the PS3 bungling. Oh, this time is so nostalgic for me. Everything about it. The conclave of weirdness where the number one game console was like this barely functioning Wiimote thing, and the number one game on it was the thing that was the packaged game. Yeah, the pre-packaged game that came with it. Yes, and it was a major hit, and it's one of the most successful Nintendo franchises for that specific reason. It's crazy. Everything about this time is, I love it. I have a lot of nostalgia for it, even if parts of it were bad, but I definitely love every single of it. So this definitely hit me like in all the nostalgia <laughs> parts all over my body. Man, do you even remember? Because even South Park had an episode like this. Do you remember? Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. Man. Fucking what a time. If you were not around for this time, tell me how you feel like looking back. Because obviously nowadays, even if the Wii was, uh, for a casual audience, seen as an extremely, like, um, important device, it's obvious that it was the worst of the three. <laughs> and I say that... Oh, with, yeah. And it's I terrible. say that knowing for a full fact that the PS3 is held up by, like, a wish and a dream. <laughs> that thing barely functions <laughs> at all and killed a lot of game devs trying to release a game on it, but I still would put that above... The game library of the PS3 just slightly above the Wii one. It was crazy to think that uh, uh, how history would remember it. But yeah, back in the day, it was a crazy time. Uh, did you ever get a Wii at launch? 
Uh, I didn't get it at launch, but I did have one. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I did eventually. But I had to get it for Smash Brawl before we also learned that that was a trip fest and that was not the best follow-up to Melee possible. <laughs> yeah, Brawl was a shit show. Yeah. Mm. Man, what a time. But yeah, uh, I really liked it for that specifically. All the Nintendo, all the like Mario references, all Ka- especially because it's Katsura is the one doing it. It makes it way more funnier. I think we've said before, Katsura is usually the funniest whenever he's on screen. Anytime and- Katsura is around, he's the funniest character. He is, and he's definitely the funniest for here. His little outfit, especially I love how like kind of detailed Katsura's outfit is. And then when you look at Elizabeth, it's just a mustache and a green hat that says E. That's the essence. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> that's enough for people to go like that's obviously luigi idiot that's enough um the breakdown of when uh, <laughs> when kondo is explaining like oh i made a promise to tay that i would get her the the we the we and then like they show the flashback of her saying like either you get this or you die <laughs> and he's like that is not a promise kondo you were threatened yeah, she goes get one for everyone here at the <laughs> hostess club or i'll flick your eyeballs <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and Shibachi's like that is not a promise. That is a threat. <laughs> that is an active threat. But it was great uh, seeing that there. Um, the Heidi bit returns, which is really funny. I don't know why they keep making references to this anime Heidi, which neither one of us have ever seen. But it's apparently a very famous anime from the nineteen seventies. <laughs> uh yeah i have no idea what it is either but no they keep I, referencing it and it's i feel like now if we're really gonna truly understand gintama jokes we need to actually do a show in an archive based off of heidi we the... need to go watch heidi <laughs> we need to go watch heidi see if it's an anime movie that's easy to do but yeah that joke around with heidi where that one guy goes like i always wanted to eat what heidi eats <laughs> and he, that's enough for him to get out of line yeah, it's just like melted cheese and he's like damn it give me that heidi food i need it um all the talk about the Famicom and the twin system, like how much he like says, like oh my god, the uh, the just pure pinnacle of technology. It has a CD drive in it, and everyone's like, dude, where the hell have you been? Yeah, <laughs> he's like gassing it up so hard. He is. Which, to be fair, I would gas up the Famicom. It's a fantastic console. Um, but either way, still, I liked it when everyone was actively shitting on that, uh, staffer guy who shows up, <laughs> the manager who's only here for two episodes, but he does a fantastic job with the two episodes. Um, uh, I like the reveal that Kondo has actually played a lot of like these VN style games where you have to try and romance yeah, the girls. They call them girl games, but they're basically like, uh, dating sims, like visual novels. Yeah. And the reveal that Kondo is actually like super, it was like, oh, I know all the answer for the, for these. I'm an expert at these. I was like, of course he would be <laughs> out of all the people yeah, of there. Anyone? <laughs> out of anyone there. Yes. The one who cannot seem to get a woman who is down to love a man with a hairy ass. The most rarest form of woman possible. He can't even figure out how to get her to like to admit liking him. He says, like, no chance. Of course, he would be amazing at these style of games. So I like that reveal, and I like the setup that it's, again, Kondo versus Katsura. Because anytime it's them two together, it's really funny. Mm-hmm. There's even, like, a zoom out where they have, they're both holding the controllers, and they're, like, superimposed over a flaming background. Yes, very well done. Probably gonna be the, mm, we'll see, I would, I would imagine that would be the, the cover art thing for the, for the episode, because it was really, I love it when they do the highly detailed gag. Uh, but yeah, the Wii, it was a great part, uh, start of part one, and I can't wait to talk about part two, but tell me what you think about this specific episode, Zen. How did you find it? Uh, it's really good. Uh, all the references are funny. Um, the elaborate plans to get out of line faster are funny. Uh, I really like the bit where Hichikata's supposed to be holding their place in line and he leaves. And they're like, oh no, it's chill, don't worry. Uh, whoever that, the badminton guy, like the, the loser guy that plays bad, yeah. They're like, don't worry, he's watching my place in line. And then they're like, oh, okay. And they look over and he's not there either. He's like, where the fuck? What's, what's he doing? <laughs> He's like playing craps. <laughs> yeah, he's playing. Uh, he's playing some kind of um, Indian sport, according to this. Oh yeah, and the he's even of... further back in line than they were, which is why they end up just bum rushing the thing. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's all funny. Katsura was the best part, but yeah. I also like the shots of dudes playing DS in the background, waiting in line. I was like, oh, this definitely captures this time. <laughs> Nothing says 2008 than a guy in line playing with a DS. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> Though eventually in Japan it would be more PSPs, but I think that's probably when Monster Hunter comes out. It's definitely it was definitely more of an even split, I think, in Japan compared to uh in North America it was only DS and you occasionally had that friend who had a PSP with jailbroken Final Fantasy seven on it. Uh yeah, that was what it was for. <laughs> yes. Was the Final Fantasy seven machine. It was hundred percent what it was, at least for us over here. But yeah, great great stuff and let's talk about the part two of it because this is the part two episode 99 life and video games are full of bugs that's still accurate to today go ahead that is true so uh the battle begins and the dating sim battle is revealed that you have to be the first one to bonk the uh main character which everyone assumes to mean fuck and then uh, it turns out to not be a normal dating sim because Kondo's like, oh, I'm so, you know, genre savvy with these. You'll never get me. Like, I- I'll never lose this. So he's like speeding through all the dialogue and he's like skipping all the conversation. And he goes, uh, okay, I expected her to be running to school with a piece of toast in her mouth. And that's not what happened. She was carrying a swordfish. <laughs> um, and so it gives him two choices of like either help her up or just go to school without her. And he's like, oh, well. Obviously, you know, if I'm trying to impress her, I will, uh, I'll help her up. And then you end up helping up the swordfish, and it's like, oh no, you, uh, you've like turned it into a swordfish, and now you can't, you can't move for 30 minutes. <laughs> um, and then Kats was like, okay, I'll leave without helping her then, because that kind of, you know, Kondo obviously picked the bad answer. And then the girl stabs him with the swordfish and murders him. <laughs> Um, and so they both have to keep starting over. So they decide that they're going to start the second game at the same time, because the crowd is like, this is going to take way too fucking long. Yeah, who, uh, who so picks play... a girl game for a video game? I know. <laughs> it's just such a good fucking lie, because even in, in this fictional world, nobody wants to watch someone play a dating sim. Uh, so they go on, and they decide to start the second game at the same time. Which is um, Nobunaga the the vomit game? Nobunaga no Jiovo. It's what it's like uh, Nobunaga's regurgitation. Is that's what it's that's yes because yeah it's yeah. a play on ambition. <laughs> yeah, on Nobunaga's ambition, uh, and he is like it's Tetris, but it's with his puke instead of regular Tetris pieces. And then it turns out you can get different levels because it's it's uh, Shimpachi versus the badminton guy. Yeah, Yamazaki's back in here. Yeah. Having a bland off. Yeah, and they're having the bland battle playing Tetris. Uh, and Shimpachi's losing badly. And Gintoki has this monologue where he's like, uh oh. Shimpachi's got to realize that whoever makes the blandest moves is going to win if he doesn't get that <laughs> under control. Um. And so they're, Kondo's like, okay, I've got this. I, I, I you know, Yamazaki's going to win that one easily. Uh, I've got this one too because I finally scored a date with the the lead character, and Katsu's like, "What? With her mom there? That's not what you know. That's not a real date." Um, <laughs> and then he, uh, Katsura gets a date with the girl's mother, <laughs> and Gintoki goes, "Oh God, his uh, his fetish for housewives is <laughs> biting us in the ass right now. Has turned problematic. Yeah, has turned problematic." Oh my god, this fucking reveal that Kasura had seduced the mother fucking killed me! Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh... It, it's turned out that the date with the girl and the mom was a trick. They thought he was, like, a, uh, an easy target to scam, so they were scamming him. And he's like, oh, fuck. Um, and then it's revealed that the mother asks Katsura to help her uh, bonk the daughter and kill her. Because they're like, oh, we can't be together while my daughter's alive. So I need you to bonk her off the cliff. And K- and Kondo's like, wait a minute. Is that what you meant by bonk the whole time? <laughs> uh, and so Kondo uh, seems to concede because he takes his hands off the controller. Uh, and at the same time, Shimpachi looks like he's doing the same because he's giving up when Yamazaki's like, I'm on a totally different level of bland from you. All I have is badminton. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Shimpachi and Kondo start, like, button mashing. And Shimpachi is ramming one of the vomit pieces into the wooden wall over and over again. While Kondo is repeatedly just 
uh, like tweaking the fucking main girl's nipple over and over again. <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh my god, wait. Uh, she's blushing now. And the funniest thing I think I've ever heard was when Katsura turns around and yells, do you really think you can bonk her before I kill her? <laughs> Oh my god. And, and, uh, and then they're like, oh my god, there's a massive comeback happening. And then it zooms out and shows that they both lost because Shinpachi's <laughs> side filled up because his plan was bad. And then Kondo's screen says, you've been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> that sequence is fucking so hilarious. The way they're. I. This. Mm, this bit is so good. The way they're just constantly smacking the button and the reveal that. First of all, the reveal that he just touches her nipple, and then he just keeps doing it over and over and over again. He's like, this is gonna work! <laughs> go! Go! And Shibachi, they show his side, he's like, this is gonna work, and he's doing it with a fucking ruler so he can go faster. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, it was... It, it, <laughs> I love this sequence so much. It's and then, like, like, after they get... They, they end up losing, and Kondo's like, oh my god, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> he just got arrested for, like, molesting that girl, basically. <laughs> and so they decide the final match is going to be two-on-two. Two, um, because that they need to do one last game. So it's Kagura and Gintoki versus Hishikata and uh, Okita. Mm-hmm. And they're doing what is essentially Dragon Quest. Um, yes. And so they meet up in the street... And they pick every character's name, and Gintoki's name is Kintoki, and he's pissed off about it. And then <laughs> Okita goes, oh, sorry, Hijikata, your name doesn't fit, so I just gave you a random name, and his name is Smegma. <laughs> which they bleep every time they say it. So good. Um, they do. So then it's revealed that like Hijikata has like no HP for some reason. And they're like, oh no, the HP was randomly allotted. That's crazy. And Hijikata turns around and stubs his toe on a sign and dies immediately. (laughs) And then Gintoki's like, ha ha, losers. And he turns around and he starts puking up blood because he started out poison. And so he's like, all right, Kagura, I need you to go get me some antidote herbs. And so Kagura finds an old man who's like, oh, uh, I know a medicine that'll heal any wound, and you have to go kill this demon king. And she's like, okay, I'll do that. Gintoki's like, no, 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 please. Just get some antidote herbs. And then the old man gives her an antidote herb, and she eats it immediately and leaves. And so uh, Okita goes to a casino and leaves Hijikata dead. And so Gintoki's like, all right, we're going to team up. I'm going to ride your coffin like a surfboard because I can't walk. And if I try to walk to the priest at the church, I'll die. Uh, and so they're like, okay, but there's no slope. How are you going to move? And he lassos the old man that gave <laughs> Kagura the the herb. And because he's an NPC, he just has like a random walk cycle. So he's like, all right, we're just going to use him. And the old man ends up walking into the forest and they get attacked by monsters. Uh, so Kintoki's like, I don't have any weapons. I can't do anything. And then the old man is in the item pocket for some reason. So Gintoki grabs him and uses him as a sword to kill these two uh, enemies. And he's like, all right, Elder, you did it. And then it's the whole time he's been trying to talk to the Elder. They've been making a joke on the there's no response. It's just a corpse thing. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, oh, okay, Uh, you can't respond. It's just an Elder or something like the Elder won't answer him. And so then he speaks to the Elder again after he uses him as a sword. And this time it actually says there's no response. It's just the corpse (laughs) because the Elder died. And, um... There's a really good bit where Hijikata's like, I can't believe you killed him. And Gintoki's like, no, I didn't. His natural born life just happened to coincidentally <laughs> end at the same time. Um, so they end up using uh, Hijikata's coffin as like a, a sand surf boat thing. Mm-hmm. And he's using the elder as like an oar by <laughs> ramming his face into the ground over and over again. And they get to a healing pond in, like, this <clears throat> bandit cave. Because that's what they're supposed to do. Is they're just supposed to fight these bandits. And that's it. Um, it cuts over to Kagura, who is fighting that demon lord to get the medicine for Gintoki. <laughs> and she wins. And it reveals that she's, like, level 80 with, like, 500 HP now. Because she's just been fucking everything up. 
Um, and they get back to the cave, and they're, like, fighting over the old man, because Hijikata wants to bury him. And um, <laughs> Gintoki wants to keep using him as a weapon. And all the bandits attack, and so they decide to split the old man in half, and each get one <laughs> half of him to use as a weapon. So they're fighting off all these bandits. Um, and then Okita shows up, and he's using the king. Because he got a jackpot in the casino, so he bought the king, and he's using the king as a weapon instead. And then a giant beam busts through the roof, and it's Kagura who's using the final boss as a weapon. Uh, and then Gintoki's like, shit, I gotta piss. And he takes off the goggles, and he realizes he's holding Shinpachi, who he's beaten the shit out of. And he looks around, and he realizes they've all been attacking the audience the entire time they've been playing. And then uh, at the it ends with a notice that the owie has been discontinued because of a notable design flaw <laughs> and it ends in the nicest way possible because we have the because uh, this is the last time we're going to be hearing the OP they play the OP fully at the end with the like they do that thing where the most times the when the arc ends because this is the last episode for year two or season two, whatever you want to call it, so they play the song off as everyone's getting beat up. Yeah. <laughs> Which I was like, this is very fitting, because it has, I think it's called Speed of Flow, and you can tell there's something different, because the the vocals are different, everything's like slightly different about it, and it was really well done. And I thought like this was actually the perfect way to end this one, because <laughs> it really does feel like the end of uh, this year. It was really well done. So, let's get into it. Man, where to begin with this one? Uh, obviously, the fight between Kondo and uh, Katsura, and at the same time, Yamazaki and Shinpachi, was amazing. I really liked that the Nobunaga is... They say specifically his drunk levels as his, like, after one of his victories is for Yamazaki... Uh, while Shinpachi's is during the Hoshi Enji incident where he killed himself, <laughs> so he's extremely drunk. And that's yeah, why and he... the other time was like he was just at a party, so like he wasn't that drunk. Yeah, <laughs> so he wasn't puking as much. He's not puking as much, and he... Shinpachi's like angry. He's like drunk is drunk. I don't know why that makes any difference. Um, I also like when they were showing off the game of Nobunaga's regurgitation, and they're specifically calling it out, saying, like, why is it so highly detailed? Why are you trying to make it look like an ambition? Like, it's, Nobunaga's ambition is nothing like what they, dis what this game is about. It's nothing like Tetris, but they're like, you're trying to really make it seem like it's one of those, uh, which was funny. Obviously, the, the mom bit with... Katsura. It's also really funny the reveal that Katsura has a thing for <laughs> widowed women. Because <laughs> it made me go like, ah, oh, I guess he does, <laughs> but I never actually thought about it. I was like, ah, oh, damn. Understandable. Uh, but yeah, that dating sim also looked really funny. The the girl game that they were playing, I would gladly play one of those. Because it seems so off the wall and wacky, especially with the swordfish. Instead of doing the classic bit of bread and mouth which is what most um, animes and girl games begins, is that you hit the girl who's running with food in her mouth, but this time she was eating a full swordfish. I also like when I think later on when Kondo is with the swordfish, is he, like, dating the swordfish at some point? Uh, no, I don't think so. Or maybe. Maybe he's there's, like, a scene of it. He's definitely with the swordfish. I think he's sleeping with the swordfish. Something is happening between him and this swordfish. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on uh, in this specific game. But yeah, uh, that was great, and especially the reveal, and especially as Kondo says, it's like, oh yeah, I bet that that was embarrassing. I basically just molested a girl in front of a whole bunch of people. Uh, I also like Kondo's statement where when the reveal is that it's a swordfish, where he says, "No, calm, no, calm down. No matter what she has in her mouth, she's still a girl from a girl game," <laughs> which, out of context, just sounds very funny. <laughs> um, and oh uh, yeah, the second Dragon Quest one. Um, I really like that they misspelled him as Kintoki because they actually explained it. I think the previous episode. That Gintoki is partially inspired by Kintoki because a lot of the characters in Gintama are based off of historical figures. So they asked him specifically, is he based off of anyone? And he says, like, yeah, kind of loosely based off of uh, Kintoki. Um, 
which I actually knew. Actually, I knew a lot of these references of Nobunaga and Kintoki because they're all characters in uh, Fago. So <laughs> I know a lot of weirdly historical facts about these Jap- <laughs> these Japanese people that I would never know beforehand. Um, but yeah, it was nice seeing him there. I also like it. This was also a bit from the Kentucky one that I forgot, but there's a part cause Kentucky's like outfit in Japanese folklore was like a sumo outfit. Um, but it's only like, it only covers the front. It doesn't actually cover the back. So there's a shot of just like Kentucky with his ass out. He's like, Hey, I don't know what you're doing showing that part of it for so long <laughs> to look away or something. Um, I like that bit. Um, I liked when he stubbed his toe and he immediately went into the coffin because it reminded me of dra- also how much Okita just doesn't want to drag a coffin around with him because <laughs> it reminds yeah, me. Of- like I'm not carrying this around the whole time. Yeah, because in Dragon Quest, that's what you do when one of your party members dies that so you have to drag him around in a coffin. <laughs> um, and yeah, the reveal at the end with the virtual reality where they're just beating everyone. And Hichikata is like, "What's the deal with this gorilla-like guy? Who are you, the leader?" And he's beating up Kondo while he's doing it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, Kagura is back at just, like, beating the shit out of someone face down. This time it's Katsura as uh, Mario, as she just <laughs> bumbles up face down. Uh, all the bits with Kagura where she's trying to do all this thing just to get a, a cure-all for Gintoki is really funny. It's really because at the beginning they said, just kill a bandit because it would take too long for you to kill the Demon King. And she kills the Demon King. And <laughs> so she would if they had actually set that as a thing, she would have easily gotten it done in time. Uh, and yeah, and all the bits with the old man, man, this is, this episode is just really, there's so much in it that I just liked. But yeah, all the part, bits with the elder and the way that they use in the fight and the way that Hichikata says like, oh, this half of, is actually kind of hard to fight with. Switch with me, Gintoki. And then it's really it's like, and then people start ch- chastising him saying like, I, I thought you cared about the sanctity of this old man and now you're using him as a weapon as well. Uh, good stuff. Good bit here. How'd you feel about it, Zen? It was good. It was, it was quality. Uh, a whole episode is funny. The reveal that they've been beating the shit out of everyone in VR is really funny. Uh, I, I can't think of anything about it that wasn't funny, to be honest. It was yeah. good the whole time. It's, I yeah. love the reveal that Kagura has just been, like, obliterating the whole game the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. And she has like her moment with the de- with the with the demon king. Yeah, she shows up with the demon king as a weapon. It's really good. Oh man, I also like that the juxtaposition of like why is everything so funky? It's like I don't know. Games are really buggy, and I was like, that's still true today. <laughs> still accurate to life and today. But yeah, fantastic episode for a Putu Parter, and a great way to kind of end the. The year two for uh, for the series as we go into year three. And we talk about it. Here it is. Episode 100. The more something is disliked, the more lovely it is. The 100th episode, Zen. Take uh, it away. I want to point out it's really funny that in the preview for this episode, they kind of show it. And the caption is like, should this really be what the 100th episode is about? <laughs> Which is a funny lead in. Yeah, I also like uh, the beginning bit where they say, I think, that the OP is too good to be played in front of <laughs> the, the, what they're about to see. Yeah, they're uh, they're going to play the opening, and they're like, you know what, it's a little bit too good, we're going to play it later. <laughs> and they were right, they're 100% accurate, it really doesn't... The Yes, go, continue on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gitoki's on a train, he's reading a Jump, and he's like, oh, this Ginterman series sucks. Uh, and the guy next to him was like, what's wrong with Gintaman? I like it. And he's like, I don't know, it just sucks. And he's like talking shit about it. Uh, and the guy is like sad, and it's revealed that he's the editor who is in charge of Gintaman. Um, <clears throat> then his superior like makes fun of him because he's like, this shit sucks. And he's like beating him up. And he's like, if you don't, uh, if you don't make this better, you know, you're going to be fired. Actually, um, which actually happens in Jump Off. Which happens all the time, yeah. yeah. Um, He's sad again on the trade, and he's back. Gintoki's there again, and he's like, I can't believe Gintaman's still in here. This shit sucks. <laughs> and so he, like, freaks out, and he's like, well, why don't you edit it then? Uh, so Gintoki's like, you know what? I will. Let me do it, because if you're going to get fired anyway, I might as well do it. Um, and he's like, okay, we're going to meet the author, but he's got 
really bad uh, like anxiety. He doesn't like people. So don't tell him anything about it. And they're like, okay. And it's revealed that he's a, like a gorilla. Yeah, which is and the... Like, yeah. Which is what most, the most manga authors are gorillas. <laughs> which is also a good bit because this is also what the manga author for Gintama is known for as being a gorilla. That gorilla we saw in those early episodes, that's supposed to be him. <laughs> so this was a direct <laughs> reference to <laughs> him. Gintoki's like, I thought all uh, manga lived in like nice houses, and he's like, No, that's only like the really good ones. This is what most uh, manga authors' houses <laughs> look like, uh, and it's like a destroyed house. And he's like, Oh, careful, there's poop right there. Uh, and then, yeah, there's like, oh, no, most manga authors are gorillas. Um, and so Gintoki's like, all right, I'm going to give you my lesson on how to, like, improve the series. And his lessons are always essentially just, like, copy Dragon Ball. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. every time he's like, all right, who's, they're doing, like, a silhouette game. And he's like, oh, this is, you know, you should be able to identify your character just from the silhouette. You know, your, your main character's too plain. Who's this? And like, oh, it's Luffy, it's Ichigo. And then he does one that's Goku. And they're like, oh, it's Goku. And he's like, no, it's Ginsan. <laughs> and it's just him dressed like Goku. And he's like, yeah, use this design from now on. <laughs> and then they start talking about rivals, and they do the silhouette rivals of all the Dragon Ball rivals. And it's like Yamcha, Tien, uh, Piccolo, and Vegeta. Yeah, did you, and then when they say Vegeta, he's like, no, it's Ginsan. And he pulls the silhouette <laughs> off, and it's him as a Super Saiyan. <laughs> This fucking bit where he re- removes the Vegeta bit and reveals it's Goku going Super Saiyan fucking killed me. <laughs> it's so fucking funny. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, that you thought it was Vegeta? Wrong. It's Goku. <laughs> it's Goku as a Super Saiyan. Uh, and then they they end up taking his terrible advice and it uh, skyrockets the series into like insane popularity because he makes like a catchphrase. Don't I don't decay. remember what it was. Don't decay. Don decay. That's it. Yeah. Uh, which is and apparently like, a gay way of saying something, which is what <laughs> was explained in there. And he's like, "Yeah, this will be great. Just use this." Uh, and so they put that in, and it gets super famous because of that catchphrase. And he's like, "Oh, the editor guy's like, I didn't want to make you know a crazy popular thing. It just happened to me, you know." And uh, <laughs> they show the anime opening of Gintaman, and it's just the Dragon Ball opening. Oh. It like starts on its own, and then it just slowly becomes the Dragon Ball opening. And I think I, <laughs> I, I don't know which one of the specific. I don't know. I don't think it's Head Shalab, but they're doing Gintama in the same parody style as that one, as one of them. I don't know which, of the three which one it is, but it's definitely following one of the cadences of it. Yeah, because it literally says this is the Dragon Ball opening. Yeah. Um, oh, and fucking... so it uh it goes through the whole thing. Uh, it even says sparking at the end. Sparky! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they land on the ground. Um, and then Ginta's laying on the, the couch reading it, and he's like, uh, this is still shitty. <laughs> still really bad. <laughs> uh, and then it ends with the reveal of the new opening and ending. Yeah, which this opening is really fucking good. I really like the animation for the opening. I'm so-so on the song. I really like the song for the ending. Yeah, the ending song is, uh, yes, I would agree on that one. The animation for the opening is definitely, I feel like if I, when I see it more, I'll get more used to it, especially when they use it for a fight scene at some point. That's the ultimate test for it. <laughs> we'll wait for the ultimate test when it's put into a, a fight scene. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> like the animation and the style they're going for. And yeah, the Kitty D was super fucking cool when they have like kids Sacha they have all of them as kids and I was like yeah they're just oh. like kids also Elizabeth as a kid is literally just smaller and looks <laughs> exactly the same holding a lollipop yeah yeah the uh the, the the flower alien when they show him as a kid and everyone's just afraid because he still has the same scary ass face as a kid yeah, he still looks scared they show Prince Hada as a baby yes that was actually very nice um oh sh- in the Dragon Ball Z opening Prince Hada, Hada is Piccolo, Piccolo. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck this should be the open <laughs> it's Prince- so funny game 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 so good, but uh, yes, but all the other ones, the other ones from kids, it, they show Yamazaki with, as a kid when he still has the tennis racket. Yeah, he's still got the uh, the badminton racket. Yep, they show Okita as a kid happy with um, 
with uh, Kondo, and then they also saw Hijikata. Like, it was just really nice to see all the characters as kids and see them before everything happens, like Tay and, um... Um... Fuck, why, is, why am I blanking on it right now? Tay and childhood friend. You know who I'm talking about. Eye patch. Oh, uh... Fuck. Uh... Kibe. Th- Yes, thank you. I was like, I don't know why the fuck this name is... <laughs> We've talked about QA so much, and for some reason, right here at this point, when they don't have the eye patches where I'm having trouble remembering them. Um, yeah, it was a really good ED, and fantastic. And yeah, then we also have a lead-in to the next five episodes, which is another five-episode arc, the Shinsen Gumi Crisis arc, which we will talk about next time. But for now, let's talk about this episode. Oh, man... I love this episode so much. First of all, when they, he's reading Gintaman, The Return of Domestic Violence, we're starting off <laughs> the that year... That was so funny, too, because he's reading it, and he's reading it in, like, a completely deadpan voice. Domestic just, like, violence. Domestic violence. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> he also says Dokkan at one point, because that's the sound of a hit. Which yeah, I thought was explosion. Really... Yep. Uh, some of these parody names are also really weird. I was trying to figure out why. Do you know why the parody for Naruto is Belt? <laughs> Yes, I do. And this is the joke I wanted to talk about, because it's unbelievable how close this is. So, the reason that the Naruto fake name is Belt is because, if you say it, like, with a Japanese accent, it would be Beruto. B-E-R-U-T-O. Which is one letter off of Boruto. Holy shit. <laughs> You're right. I... It's, it's one letter off of Boruto. Which came out years and years after this episode aired. Maybe this is actually like uh, prophetic because this is also the first time Goku's ever been put with silver hair. Hmm. Oh, that's true. It's ultra instinct. Hair. Yeah, that's why I was like, oh, that's just straight up Goku because that's basically just M U I Goku, but with like a super detailed face. <laughs> But no, I was looking at that shit, and I was like, oh, because at first I didn't get it either, because I was like, Belf, like, what the fuck does that mean? But then they show him reading the book, and it says B-E-R-U-T-O on, on it, like, written on the book as, like, a oh. uh, thing. So, yeah, it's supposed to be like, oh, if you say it in Japanese, it's Beruto, so it looks like Naruto. That uh, makes sense. <laughs> but then that, that is literally one letter off of Boruto. If it was B-O That's instead funny. of B-E. So close. That's a good joke. Uh, obviously, One Piece is one park. Uh, Hunter x Hunter is hanger, hanger. Yeah, hanger, hanger. And then they're like, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know when it's going to be on hiatus again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's going back into hiatus. When is it coming yeah. back? <laughs> and uh, then uh, there's a really fucking good one. Um because Dragon Ball's name is literally just like Dragon Ball. Like, they just say Dragon Ball, but it's, like, technically not. I don't remember what the fake name is, da- but it's so close. Yeah, it's so crazy close. Um, man, also this bit. There's also a really good... I was like, oh my god. The, when they go, instead of JoJo, it's Yo-Yo's. And they yeah, talk... Yo-Yo's. And they're like, oh, all manga authors are gorillas, but he's like, uh, not the, not the author of Yo-Yo's Happy Adventure or whatever. Wonderful like, Adventure. He, yeah, he's always beautiful. And doesn't grow old. Yeah, and then the caption that explains it is, uh, this is a parody of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Hirohiko Araki is the author who is known for looking exactly the same over 20 years. <laughs> and then they reveal, oh, that's because he's a fairy. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh no, he's not a gorilla, he's a, an immortal fairy. That was great. Uh... Also, uh, the gorilla being the stand-in for Sorochi, who is the uh, the maker of Gin- Gintama, was really good. Because there's a bit where the guy is talking about the success that he like that he said he created, and they cut back to the gorilla just fucking angry. <laughs> yeah, and he's got a headband on that's like, "Don't miss your deadline." <laughs> Don't miss your deadline, <laughs> which is really good. Um. And in general, the gorilla is, like, super receptive to a lot of the ideas Kintoki's having. He's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. He's like, oh, you love it? What? You think that's a really good idea? Like, when he's making the point about the silhouette, that you can't tell the difference between silhouettes of, um, 
your main character. He's like, what's your distinction? He's, oh, he has silver hair. He goes like, good job, idiot. You, <laughs> you're you a black and white comic, and your main character's focus point is yeah, that he has silver hair. color to differentiate your characters, idiot. Good job. Um, also, the, his, like, breakdown of what a straight man brings to the comedy. And he starts just making fun of the editor, saying, like, let me show you how many times you said why during that last bit. He, like, rewinds the episode. And yeah, he-, he brings out a TV. And he's like, watch this. And he just starts playing the episode on the TV. <laughs> over and over and over again. Just Which feels like he's just, like, making fun of this guy over and over again. He's like, let me show you the ultimate straight man. Uh, and he does one more joke where he's like, this is gintas and he's like in Super Saiyan 3 mode. And that's yeah, when... Yeah, because they're like, well, then who's the, the best straight man? And he goes, it's gintas and it's using Super Saiyan 3. <laughs> and that summons Shinpachi. And what who... was their Saiyan parody? He's like a super, like... Suyan? Something like super, that? Yeah, super, like, super Suyan or something, and they're like... <laughs> yeah, because the, the editor starts saying, like, he's super Saiyan. Like, he has so many questions in such a short bit. But I love that they made that bit on purpose not work because he's asking so many questions and then that's the joke is that they're going to look back and uh, make fun of him. Uh, the, all the bit of Dragon Ball, all his advice is basically just make it like Dragon Ball, which is maybe the most, <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> the most real thing that you could ever say to a show to jump on. <laughs> yeah, that, that felt like that was a legitimate like call out. Like, yes. Especially- make it more like Dragon Ball. Especially his eyes when he says, it's Gintasan. <laughs> and he's, like, so dead as he's revealing a Goku. <laughs> and, of, of course, when they do the parody of Vegeta, or he calls him Bajita, oh, I cannot stress enough how much I fucking love this gag so much, because it looks so much like Vegeta just to reveal it's Goku. <laughs> also, the bit where, um... He, he, sh- he shows, like, okay, so, you know, you basically just follow the formula of... Hero defeats rival, rival becomes friend, new rival appears. And he's drawing arrows from each one. And he circles Tien, Piccolo, and Vegeta. And the author's like, wait, what about that? Isn't that Yamcha? And he's like scratching him out. And he's like, no. Namcha. <laughs> not- the- Namcha doesn't figure into the cycle. And then he goes, <laughs> add Namcha to the cycle! <laughs> yeah, and then G- Gitogi kicks the whiteboard down and he screams, Yamcha! <laughs> no! so dedicated for it which i also loved because he's he's so right about this <laughs> repeating this and dragging it on is the standard jump formula <laughs> oh and yeah this opening of ginta man is so good with fucking hijikata as vegeta in the saiyan armor fighting gintoki up in the air because he's wearing like this regular like uh vegeta cloth and then he transforms slightly into an ape and then he turns on the saiyan armor uh is really good the old man from the um, the who makes the robots is the roshi of it i th- i don't know if mm-hmm. his kagura gohan or is he or krillin <sighs> Because uh, both no, of them are Go- Gohan and Krillin in the opening next to I, him. I just don't know I which is which. I think that she's supposed to be Gohan because at this point she's a little bit shorter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think there's any differentiating factor between either one. That's wait, wait, doesn't Krillin wear those sunglasses that Shinpachi has on at some point? Okay, yes, I, he does, he does, he does. So yeah, Shinpachi is Krillin then. Yeah. And, uh, and then Chikata is Vegeta and Katsura is Tien? <laughs> yeah, Tien <laughs> of all characters. <laughs> Which really makes me think, like, is is Katsura the TN of Gintama? Also, he's really good because he's, like, he's got a headband on with the third eye on it, which is, he's got candles in the headband. Oh, you're right. I didn't even notice that. It's really good. It's really well done. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that, that, when his main thing is being, like, you need just a catchphrase, which I feel like is also making fun of Naruto with his Databayo. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. When he comes in, especially because he, he's selling Dondake so hard, and then later on when the episode ends and they're talking about, like, I guess that was the 100th episode, they start making fun of Shinpachi for saying D- Dondake so much. He's like, I guess I'm just not going to say it anymore. <laughs> Dondake, I'm, uh, I feel kind of self-conscious now. <laughs> I'm not well, no, it was, it was actually, the way that that bit was written, that it took me a minute to figure it out, was this, he says, when did the chapter for this episode come out? It was like a year ago. So we made it popular a year ago, and now it's gotten lame by the time the anime episode has come out. So now it's actually lame to say that. And Shinpachi's like, I can't help it. That's the only word in my script for this episode. I have to keep saying it, but I hate it. 
Oh, poor Shimpachi. But <laughs> yeah, this was uh, this is a fantastic. There, there's nothing. The, whenever we'd get to a fifty or one hundred one, a lot of the ones that just make fun of like the Shonen Jump stuff are some of my favorite. <laughs> this one is specifically because there's so much Dragon Ball. Uh, related stuff and how much his plan boils down to I think if you made this Dragon Ball it would be really popular <laughs> it's really funny it's so funny when he's like just copy Dragon Ball and then they, they do down to like the anime opening and like yeah it's great yeah it's, <laughs> it's almost, amazing it's super popular and it works out for everything oh man really how do you feel about it really funny it, the Boruto thing is unreal to me by the way like holy fuck yeah, so insanely close. It, it made me laugh so fucking hard. Um, every joke in this was really good. The the reveal that Vegeta's silhouette was Super Saiyan Goku was really funny. Um, the the idea that just steal Dragon Ball and that's it and it works <laughs> is really funny. Um, I really like the bit at the end where Gintoki's like, "Man, this still really sucks." Yeah, he's and still... he's like reading it all depressed. He, they're really just ta- going for the gut of of Shonen Jump readers. Yeah, it's literally just like outright mocking everything that people talk about with Shonen Jump. Yeah, they do. Because what what is? Oh man, this great line that Gintoki says. Well, please don't follow up my jump anymore. I want to read more story like comics. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Like, everything related about this is so good. I think one of the best things they could have done for Gintoki was making him just a huge fan of Shonen Jump. Because I think they also said, like, you're a big fan of Shonen Jump. He's like, yes, I am. He's like, you do know we've been at this for a couple years now, and you're asking for a full-on rework of the series? So like, yeah, it's fine. It'll all work out in the end. Yeah, I like when uh, he says, um, oh, I've been reading Jump for 20 years, and then he acts like he doesn't know what Dragon Ball is. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> Not a thing. Really good. Yeah, this is a fantastic 100 episode. I can't think of anything that kind of sums up a lot of Gintama stuff than this one. And this yeah, one's also a, super funny. a celebration for the 40th anniversary of Shonen Jump, I think. Yes, the 40th anniversary of Shonen Jump. Yes, so... Fucking great stuff, man. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's 100 episodes of Gintama Down, Zen. Man, this series. What a hell of a series we've gone through. Mm-hmm. I fucking love Gintama. It's so good. It is. It's so good. It really is. Um, and thank you very much for sticking with us, uh, dudes watching it. For all of the ups and the downs, which is us missing episodes. <laughs> Those are the mm-hmm. deaths. It, it, uh, oh, and the uh, the transphobic episode. Those are the only two downs, though. Other than that, it's been a fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's been really good. Other than that, a little bit. Of stuff other there. other than those two little snags, it's been fantastic to talk about Gintama with a lot of all of y'all, and for you guys to stick with us for so long. Because who knows? You guys are dedicated enough to go and listen to it over hour long, almost hour and thirty minutes of us just talking about Gintama jokes and laughing at it. <laughs> That's dedication, and we appreciate you guys very much. We do appreciate the dedication. Mm-hmm. And so, next week, we will be talking about episodes 101 to 105, which is the Shinsengumi Crisis arc. Um, that's the name of the arc. I don't know anything else other than the little end bit that we have here. We'll see what that's all about. I'm interested to see what it's about. It's going to be the first one of season three, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but it also feels like this is the one big one. This is the big, no, there's another one. That's also pretty low. There's a couple. Okay. This and another arc later down the road are like big episode ones where it's like a lot of episodes. So we'll see how this one stacks up. And yeah, that's it for Shonen Archive, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. As always, you can find Zen over on his channel where he does Shonen and Chill with the Ocean Man. Where he can you if you want to hear him do his Gintoki impression as he talks about all the latest chapters that he doesn't like, <laughs> you can check out. <laughs> he also talks about ones he likes. It's not all <laughs> negative. 
But you can enjoy that over there on his channel. If you want more stuff featuring me, obviously you can just keep on this channel here. I also have a Twitch where me and Zen play, uh, currently the plan is bad video games on Mondays. <laughs> That's We will continue until I yes. break. It's uh, the next episode is The Lion King. Yes. Super next excited for that. Oh yeah, super excited for that. Um, and yeah, that's it everyone. We will see you guys in the next one. Happy 100 episodes. And we will keep on keeping on. Say goodbye, Zen. Goodbye, everybody.